This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Technology. Well, yeah, you know, this, this is so interesting to uh, talk to Prashant Doshi. Um, we were chatting before the show, and now we're on the air. And uh, he is the chief evangelist. I'm going to let him explain what that is of Shreem, Shreem LLC. I'm going to let him explain what that is. Welcome back to the show, Doshi. It's so nice to have you here. Wonderful to be here, Jay. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And thank you. Thank you for your support and your what do you want to say, philosophical support that you provide to ThinkTech. And we need you more. I told you before, you have to come here because Hawaii needs you. Doshi, what do you think? Are you going to come back soon? Well, you had a big influence in, uh, in a life decision that I made recently. I think I, I told you about that. You said almost exactly those words a number of months ago, and, um, and that uh, fostered the decision that I need to be in Hawaii. This company is based in Hawaii. Uh, while it be global in nature, the, the hub is in Hawaii, and uh, I want to see technology advanced in Hawaii and hope to be, play a small role in that. Yeah, don't forget, uh, you know, ThinkTech is about uh, technology and energy. Uh, it's about diversification and in large parts about globalism. Um, so we, we see a great role for Hawaii, a global role going forward. We haven't got there yet, but I think we have all the elements. And if you came, you, you know, you could be the kind of catalyst. You know what I mean? A cat, that's what you are. You are a historical <laughs> catalyst, Doshi. So, you know, there's a calling for you here, you know? <laughs> Uh, I, I, and that is that is amongst one of the words that's been used to describe me. Sure, one of the better words. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to ask about the others. <laughs> so tell me what you're doing these days. You were telling me you, you were at Yale yesterday, today, um, talk, talking about um, oh gee, uh, uh, very important issues affecting our society. Um, what are you doing at Yale, and um, why Yale? Well, and don't you know that Yale is an inherent part of Hawaii because the missionaries all came from Yale. <laughs> I, you know, that you just informed me about that. That's, that's great to know. I was actually at uh, seven universities in the last few days and um, all around New England. Uh, you know, as, as I, I think you might know, I'm, I'm from MIT, but that's the one university I didn't visit. Uh, I went to a, a bunch of them and really trying to understand uh, a number of things, what's going on in terms of the latest uh, in, in terms of research and technology that can be applied to a variety of social problems uh, around the world. Uh, as you know, uh, mental health is a big issue. Uh, it's uh, in suicide being it's one of its uh, worst outcomes. It's something we're gonna be working on and I wanted to survey what the latest thought process, uh, processes are amongst the universities and, and the approaches that, that are going on. What have you, uh, found? you know, I, I well, you, you know, I'll tell you, let, let me let me step back a second. Right. You know, I think we were talking a little bit about the context of what's going on in, in the world. And let, let's just take America for a second. I don't think I've ever seen this country in my 44 years on this planet as divided as it currently is. Uh, we have, you know, major issues, the appointment uh, of a Supreme Court judge, for instance, just being the most recent iteration of the of, of the nasty divide between two political parties. In fact, Jay, I got to tell you, I don't know anyone that's you know intelligent that actually can be represented well by either party. Most people are a mix of of views that come from both sides. Yet we take these hard lines uh, and waste our time and a lot of uh, money and energy in focusing on the next election instead of focusing on things that actually matter. Uh, you know, climate change is a big one in Hawaii. I think we have a a real appreciation for that, not so much anymore, uh, particularly in Washington, D.C. There was a great study that came out of the MIT Media Lab recently that said climate change is correlated with uh, a poorer mental health. And, uh, you know, if, if we th that, that, that was a big surprise to me. If you think about it, and they, they talked about warming weather and the effects that it has on people and the degradation in mental health, and we're headed in one direction, warmer weather, so we can also predict that we're going to have further degradation in mental health. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, that's, that's one of the things that I, I recently learned about. Yeah, there's all these negative things happening, and, I, and my, I'm developing my own theory about this, is that if all these negative things are happening all around you and everywhere you look, it's, it's negative and threatening, you, it begins to affect your, your state of mind. I mean, it, and it should. Um, and, and when it affects your state of mind over a period of time, uh, it erodes your, your good nature, it erodes your 
positive thoughts about it, it gives you mental health issues is what I'm saying. And I think that's happening well, in this country. Uh, undoubtedly, there was another study, I, I can't remember, I think it may, may have been out of a UK university, The Guardian had published it, that said watching the news is one of the greatest causes of stress in people's lives. <laughs> There you go. No, I'm, I'm being very serious because of, of the things that we see. Uh, of course, not quality programming like Think Tech Hawaii, uh, which, of course, you know. <laughs> uh, no, but this is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a time where we're not focusing a lot on the, uh, the core issues. Uh, you know, California right now has nearly 50 percent of the homeless population in the country, uh, and there's no sign of abatement. Uh, we have, you know, the division between the rich and the poor is increasing. The digital divide is separating people left and right. Here we are, we can pontificate about things like blockchain or cryptocurrency, and we have people who don't have access to basic computer literacy in this, in this country. We're not talking about a third world country. We're talking about our United States of America. And so, uh, you know, I, I think it's high time as a country that we put aside a lot of our partisan views and approaches and get back to business. In the meantime, uh, one of the areas you want to look at is uh, is China. Now, take you know the the advantage of not having a democratic society. Uh, one of the few advantages of being a totalitarian society is that you can get things done. China is moving so far ahead, so quickly in quantum computing, in AI, in blockchain. The number of patents and intellectual property pieces that are coming out of China far exceed what's happening in the U.S. The Chinese premier recognizes that there is a race for blockchain around the world. They look at blockchain as Internet 3.0. And most of our politicians couldn't even tell you what the heck blockchain is and don't even know that there is actually a race. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm with you on it completely. And uh, I, I see the U.S. as uh, backing off a, a leadership role, which includes technology. And if you back off and isolate yourself, then all kinds of negative things happen. We haven't even started talking about, you know, the, uh, the human flow. Remember that movie, Ai Weiwei movie? 60 million people are in camps in this, in this world right now, and there's no future for them. There's no yes. plan. There's no hope. It's like the homeless in California. And, and, and you, yes. you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. You're not even close. How are we ever going to resolve these things? That's my question. <laughs> Well, you know, and just so it doesn't seem as if I'm beating up on my home country, the U.S., the U.K. is doing no better, right? If you look at – on any given day, can you decide, you know, whether you're in or you're out? Is Brexit occurring or is it not occurring? Yeah. The confusion that's led by this, you know, division around the world between nationalism, things like nationalism and globalism, left and right, Democrat or Republican, Tory or, you know, liberal, it, it, these are divides that – are, are separating us from our inherent humanity, which that context needs to exist if we're going to then solve problems and use things like technology to solve real world pro problems and innovate as we as we you know obviously continue to need to do. And that's where you come to you because you're a technology person, because you're an entrepreneur, an innovator, and because I know you have a larger plan. And to the extent you'd like to let us in on it, I wonder if you can tell us uh, how you're organizing organizing yourself to deal with these problems because it's not only making money it's preserving the world that we have grown accustomed to well first of all that's a great question that you ask you know i think i mentioned this on your last show our uh, first sort is the operating philosophy of shream our company uh we're putting a, in addition to directly using technology to apply to social problems we're donating 11 percent of our net profit back to the communities uh, or the, you know, the governments or the jurisdictions from which we would make, you know, we make money. So that's our, our contribution. I think the CSR requirement in India, for example, is 2%. We're, you know, we're at 11%. So that's, that's, that's a great. statement that we're making. You know, and, and in fact, and, uh, you know, I, have, uh, I won't mention the CEOs of the, some of the top three, uh, now you probably know, uh, you know, top three to five uh, large tech companies in the world that I have uh, personally, you know, uh, you know, reprimanded and, and chided over email and not taking leadership uh, in, you know, technology is, if you operate a technology business well, it generally is going to operate at a higher margin than a bricks and mortar business. And that to me means you have an opportunity and a responsibility to give back, to use uh, whether, you know, you're using uh, employees' time to contribute to these things or you're giving back a percentage of your profit or whatever those mechanisms are. There are bricks and mortar companies, companies like, 
Starbucks that are doing incredible things. Did you know? I don't know if you know this, Jay. You're if you're a barista or you know you're working in a Starbucks, you can get an online degree from Arizona State University, paid for by Starbucks and the and the Howard Schultz Foundation. That's great. That's le- That's leadership. You know, that's that's taking a real stand. And what you're doing is leadership. I'm, I'm comparing it against a uh, a great piece I saw yesterday on PBS called uh, The American Experience. And it was the Transcontinental Railroad, which was built with, largely with Chinese labor in the 18, 1860s through 1869 when they drove the Golden Spike at Promontory Point. And, um, of course, immediately after that, uh, the Grateful Nation sent them all back to China uh, with the Chinese Exclusion Act. But beyond that, though, uh, what happened in the, in the Transcontinental Railway was everybody was for himself. Uh, and the, the amount of scoundrels who put that thing together, you know, it was incredible. And, and the amount of graft and corruption was incredible. That can't happen now. Thanks to people like you, uh, you know, who do impact investing and who call CEOs up and try to straighten them out, uh, we will have a better world. We just need more people like you, Doshi, that's all. You know, I, I do appreciate it and, and thank you so much uh, for, for your compliments. But I think, you know, it's, 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 it's awareness, right? It's a consciousness. I think this is one of the huge strengths of Hawaii. When you're in Hawaii, you can't, uh, partly due to the isolation, one of the most geographically isolated places in the world, but also because of the confluence of cultures. We have, you know, the, the spirit of what has been brought forward by the native Hawaiian folks to the, uh, the islands combined with people from both east and west. It's a confluence of all these cultures and mix of ideas and quite literally living on an island that forces people to work together in ways that you rarely see in other parts of the world. So even though you may be liberal or conservative or whatever it is that you are, there's a commonality that, is, that I believe is pervasive in Hawaii that you don't see in other places. And I think that's, that approach, that context, is one of the key things that is needed. You know, right now in Silicon Valley, um, I, I joke about this with a lot of folks, is, is how do you make a, a billion-dollar company uh, very easily? You go to Silicon Valley, you lose a lot of money, and you tell your friends on Sand Hill to fund it. That's <laughs> the way to make a lot. That's a, there you go. There's the there go. essential recipe. <laughs> Me, meanwhile, there, you know, technology, I think we talked about this last time as well, technology is something that can be developed anywhere. Innovation is occurring everywhere. And I think, you know, I, I personally believe because of the high cost of living, there are a lot of folks, you know, I had a, two friends of mine, they're a ma- married couple. One of them is working at a top law firm. The other guy, won't mention the name of the company, but also working at a top tech company, called me. They're combined making about, I don't know, three four $400,000 and are not able to afford a home in Silicon Valley. Can you believe that? So when you take those top earners and they're calling me to say, hey, you have some extra consulting work or things we can do because, uh, you know, we can't make it happen here. <laughs> what, what, is, what is that? Jay, what does that say for the teacher, the, the fireman, the, you know, all the people that are needed as part of the, uh, the you know, socioeconomic spectrum? Well, so they're in trouble. These are the things that, they're in trouble. And, and, and as with the other threads we've identified here, they're going to be in greater trouble. So somebody has to look out for them. The same notion that Kagan wrote about in his book about the, uh, the jungle grows back, uh, dealing with uh, you know, isolationism and its effects on the world, uh, also applies in this country. We have to take care of each other. Uh, we have to see everybody as our brother. We have to be a, a, a national gathering, all trying to take care of each other. And if, if we take that mindset, as you do, uh, you know, then maybe it'll be better. We can deal with these threads and make them, turn them into positive. Yeah? Well, one of the other things, Jay, I want to speak to is something I'm very passionate about is I spoke uh, in between uh, since our last uh, you know, TV show that we had. I was in Monaco. Um, there was a family office summit uh, under Prince Albert II there, and I had the opportunity to speak. And the last statement that I made is that the greatest thing that we could do as a humanity, as a, as a culture, as a, a group of people on this planet to advance ourselves is to put enable, empower, and put women in positions of power and influence in every field possible, whether that's politics, whether that's business, what have you. Now, this isn't just something that I believe in from a sort of philosophical point of view. We have an imbalance of yin and yang 
on the planet. We have an imbalance between the masculine and feminine principle. Now, let me give you some business thoughts. Uh, studies have shown that a, an enterprise, uh, a, a new business that has at least one woman co-founder co performs 20% better than an all-male team. So there you have it. These are the hard facts that suggest that we need more women. And what do we have happening right now? I dare to say, uh, you know, in this country, it seems like to get elected to some position, you have to uh, have had on your track record some uh, some abuse of the feminine principle. Oh, and uh, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, you know, this, I, I mean, I, I, it's it's quite surprising to me that we, we're not more. Uh, you know, vigilant about these things. But what can we do in our own field in business and in tech is uh, get more, more women across the world into STEM and uh, put them in positions of influence. Let's, you know, eliminate this glass ceiling of, of earnings and, and what kinds of roles, uh, you know, women can be involved in. Because yeah. they completely, we need, their, we need that balanced approach. It's part of a social quotient, I think. Uh, that's Prashant Doshi. He is the chief evangelist and you can see what I mean and what he means by chief evangelist of Shreem LLC, <laughs> an impact investment organization. Uh, and, and we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to talk about this inspirational trip he took recently to Jerusalem uh, in Israel. We're going to find out why and what he saw and what he learned and what he wants to tell us about that. We'll be right back with Prashant Doshi. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. When I was growing up, I was among the one in six American kids who struggle with hunger. But with the power of breakfast, the kids in your neighborhood can think big and be more. Go to hungeris.org to make breakfast happen for kids in your neighborhood. I could play, so any chance you play at all, you know, that's my life. I love music. Yeah, that's how we do it. Aloha. I'm Marsha Joyner, inviting you to come visit with us on Cannabis Chronicles, a 10,000-year odyssey, where we explore and examine the plant that the muse has given us. And stay with us as we explore all of the facets of this planet on Wednesdays at noon. Please join us. Aloha. Manhattan. I went to school at NYU Law School, and going back to Manhattan is such a trip for me. It's not just a nostalgia. It's seeing all these luscious apple-type things that are in Manhattan. It takes me back, and it takes me you know, to another level. But speaking of travel, Doshi, I really want to find out what happened in Jerusalem. You know, Israel is such a hot button these days, and you decide you want to go there. Why did you want to go there? What was the, what was the cause? You know, uh, I, I think uh, you may know this, but I was present during 9-11 uh, in New York City, uh, and I ended up uh, running a part of the disaster relief efforts for the city, uh, one of the two disaster relief centers. It was one of the most powerful times in my life. It took a tragedy, a crisis, a nas uh, something bigger than that's happened in our history, to enable us to collaborate in ways that I've not seen before. Uh, we saw, you know, people from uh, government, all the variety of government agencies, nonprofits, private sector, uh, you know, humanitarians, volunteers coming together in a way that was uh, simply beautiful. It was one of the most powerful experiences of my life. I, I've been away from uh, New York for about 16, 17 years, and uh, I came back finally to New York. Uh, I'm here for the entire fall, and uh, it was, of course, during the the anniversary of 9-11. Uh, of mm. And about a few, a few weeks before 9-11, I felt very, I was on the Upper East Side and I felt very inspired that I should go to Jerusalem. It was about three in the morning, you know, I'm, I'm up before three every morning and go take a walk to go see what's going on. And uh, I thought I needed to go to Jerusalem. And I walked to the end of the block and I was on Jerusalem Street. So I said, okay, they're in. There it There's is. There's a sign, I need to well, Let me, I, I let me to just to stop you there and say, I mean, some of the best ideas <laughs> come to us when we're, we're by ourselves and we're just ruminating about our lives and our place in the firmament, and there it is, there's the idea. And those are the ideas you have to act on. Those are the ideas that, that make for a really rich, nourishing life. And I'm, 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 I will remember this story, Doshi. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, so so I so I went and and of course uh, you know this year it wasn't only 9/11 but uh, right you know it was the ter- uh, time of Rosh Hashanah. So this was my first trip to Israel. And of course, you know, I didn't know what to expect, but I had images in my mind of what Jerusalem might be. And it was quite different than what I had been expecting. I mean, Jerusalem is incredibly, I I thought this was going to be just all history and all very sacred and sanctimonious and what have you. And and it's a real city and it's a real place. I mean, there are real things going on. There are people at cafes and bars and living regularly. You know, people are very similar everywhere. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, I went to the, uh, you know, had the great opportunity of, of staying right outside of the old city. Uh, and uh, I went in, in, through the old city several times, different times of the day, um, and spent a couple of times at the wall. And, uh, and that was one of the most, pro- the, the Western Wall, of course. Yes. Uh, one of the most powerful experiences of my life, deeply transformative, had a set of inspirations that uh, came from that experience, and I don't think it'll ever leave me. Can you talk about it in greater detail, please? Sure, sure can. Um, so, you know, one of the things that led up to it was actually traversing the different parts of the old city. So I don't know if people know, but there's a, you know, there's a Jewish quarter, there's a Christian quarter, there's a Muslim quarter, and then there's actually an Armenian quarter as well. And, uh, you know, most people don't traverse between the, the different sectors, but they're all within, you know, strike, I mean, literally within, you know, a couple hundred meters of each other. And I went, of course, you know, through, I, I guess I can sort of blend in with whatever group and uh, went through all, this, uh, all the different sectors of the, uh, of, the, of the old city. And it was a very powerful experience. Uh, and what I saw more than the differences were the commonality. Now, of course, you know, there are different sort of socioeconomic segments throughout that city. But the, the commonalities are what strike you. There are people that are, uh, you know, vending. They're selling their goods and wares, people eating, people going to prayer, people going to school and doing their things, kids playing, uh, you know, football or soccer, wherever they are. And it was, uh, you know, within this little space uh, of, you know, less than a mile, the microcosm, you know, became the macrocosm. And so the experience at the wall, so Jay, one of the things I'll tell you is I was originally planning to go to the Temple Mount. Um, and of, of course, uh, there are certain times that I can, and I've been to mosques around the world. And after being at the wall a couple of times, I could not go to the Temple Mount. Why not? Uh, I, well, I, I learned that the Temple Mount is not accessible to uh, uh, people of the Jewish faith or Christian faith or basically anyone else. Uh, to go up there, uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, of course, is up there. Mm-hmm. Uh, to go and pray their their uh, pray their own prayer, pray their their own faith, and that to me is the symbol of what's wrong with our world today. You have, I mean, it's an enormous complex up there. There's space quite literally for everyone, and I really do understand what the people of the Jewish faith, and not only the Jewish faith, the Christian faith, and others are yearning for is a return to the Temple Mount. Let's put aside what structure is up there, but the fact that people can go up there of any faith, of all faiths around the world, uh, and, and do what they need to do, and that they can't, that is the, sim- that is the microcosm of the macrocosm. Mm. So I, too, said that I'm not going to go up there until everyone is allowed up there. And whether that happens in my life or, you know, we Indians, you know, do believe that in reincarnation, if I have to come back, I'll come back. And, uh, you know, I'll wait. Uh, so the, the uh, part of what I saw there is if we could solve, uh, and, and by the way, it's under Jordanian control. And I, uh, you know, officially tell the Jordanian government right now, it's kind of time to, to step up to the plate here and, and open, that, open it up. They could change it in a stroke of a pen, yeah. Th- they absolutely could. And I'm not, I'm not taking sides here. I mean, it's a, there are a complex set of issues there. But that Temple Mount really does symbolize, you know, everyone, Palestinians, uh, uh, Jewish people, Christian people, anyone, Hindus, Jains, whomever, everyone should be allowed up there because it's a glorious place that's important to people throughout the world. And so I, I see the, that microcosm uh, being the macrocosm. Is If we can solve it there, frankly, I believe that we can solve it everywhere. Yeah. Were you afraid at all? Uh, you know, people, there is terrorism in Israel. It's on the streets. Sometimes yeah. people are attacked for no reason. Uh, did you feel that, see that? Did you uh, have any fear over it? 
Jay, I got to tell you, there are neighborhoods around this country that scare me a lot more than uh, <laughs> Thank you than for that. Sure. <laughs> And, 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 and Jay, you know, I, I make it a point to go through them because I'm up at three or four and I'm looking for what's happening really from a socio point of view. And you, you find out what's really happening. Uh, you know, Picasso painted a picture I just saw or a painting at, uh, at Yale. It's there. It's uh, Le Café Nuit, you know, what, what happens at night in the cafe. And what you, what you learn at night at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., you don't learn in any other part of the day. So, no, I, I, I was not. I, I, I felt very inspired. And, and I'm one of those people who believes when it's my time, it's my time anyway. So, uh, but, but I will say that um, I, I was actually quite impressed with how easy it was to get around Jerusalem and how comfortable. I mean, it was like being in any other European city. As soon as you walk out of the old city and you're, you're, and you're hanging out and you're going around, I mean, there were people right after Rosh Hashanah, there were people parting their butts off until like four in the morning. I was like, wow, this is <laughs> very different. I mean, it, it, it's a thriving city and there's a lot of great stuff happening there. I, I find that so interesting. Uh, the Israelis, uh, they, don't, they, they somehow deal with the, the risk of losing their country losing their lives in some sort of horrible attack. Uh, and they party and they live normal lives and uh, they're, they're regular citizens, all of them. And uh, quite remarkable. I, I, and, and then a few miles away on the border, you find these kibbutzim yeah. where people live underground to avoid the, uh, the regular mortar shells and rockets and all that. So it's, it's really, uh, it's a dichotomy, it's a, a contradiction of sorts to see the parties in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Yeah, no, no, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think one of the things is that we as humanity kind of want to um, reach some sort of equilibrium on a day-to-day -day basis. You can't live in extreme fear and then still operate your regular day-to-day -day life uh, in that way. One of the things I found was, was amazing is that I think people really identify themselves as Israelis. So you can have people from Palestinian or Jewish background that are friends that are going out, that are doing the things that people do across the world. Uh, I, I think we, we have a very different view, you know, and I, I sort of discredit our press in America with painting pictures that really are, are not real. I, I would encourage anyone from any part of the world to make a visit to Jerusalem. I mean, I think it's one of the places in the world that one should make a visit. Uh, and, and I believe it's, uh, there are many buses and tour groups from literally around the world. There were women wearing their saris walking around. I mean, it was just, it, it was impressive. And, um, and I think, you know, the Israeli Defense Forces, yeah, which consists of people from everywhere again, yeah. uh, do uh, a brilliant job of, of, of making sure things are okay. You can't control everything. But the, you know, to the best possible. So I think it's it's absolutely worth a visit. Yeah. And definitely inspirational. Yeah, I I uh, I'm always impressed with the the citizen quality of the army. And you'll be riding a bus, and there'll be a guy sitting right next to you holding a uh, a rifle, and he'll be like 17 <laughs> or 18 years old, like you could pinch his cheeks. He's a sweet young man, you know. And there he is holding the yeah. rifle on the bus with everybody. <laughs> it's a disconnect. <laughs> And well, it happens in Paris too. You know, go land in a Paris airport, and if you can get your luggage on time and you get out there to the metro stop, there are people walking around with rifles there too. No. <laughs> it's a world we live in. So, so uh, what, did, what did you learn about the uh, how the Israelis? And I know there are many constituencies in Israel, but how do the Israelis feel about the U.S.? How do they feel about Trump? How do they feel about you know the current isolationist policy? How do they feel about moving the capital uh, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem? Yeah, the, uh, you know, so it's a very complex set of issues, and I you know, certainly don't want to claim to you know, represent all Israelis. But for, of the many conversations that I did have, I, I will tell you, I, I think, um, uh, for, first of all, again, I want to reiterate that I think they identify themselves as Israelis and so are able to get along in a way uh, that might really surprise us here in the U.S. I mean, I think that, you know, they're they get along better than a lot of our Democrats and Republicans do in D.C. So let's start there. I think uh, they are quite surprised. You know, one of the things is you would be surprised at how much better information people get from their press overseas than we do in the U.S. Ah. So whether it's, the, whether it's the BBC or Al Jazeera, the average Israeli knows more about what's happening in American politics 
than the average American. Uh, and that, that, so, you know, now think about it. Uh, this makes some sense in, in, from the following, which is they have to keep up on what's going on because they're under constant threat of some sort anyway. Uh, so they need to know which way the you know, prevailing winds are going. But I was impressed at how educated folks were there. And, uh, and so that, that, that's the impression that I was left is they have a lot more insight about what's going on in America. And I think there's a real concern about this divide that we have in America and how that might precipitate into what happens there. Yes. <coughs> that is certainly, I can imagine how that works because we're their protector in so many ways. And if we can't function, if we have a divide, that threatens them for sure. So let me, let me ask you my last question because we're almost out of time, Doshi. You know, sure. so, this was, so there you are walking on the east side of Manhattan at three o'clock in the morning and having this uh, epiphany about going to Israel. You go to Israel, you come back, and you go to Israel during the high holidays, which is really a wonderful time to go. It's sort of sense, you know, the essence of the place. Um, you come back, and I just want to know, you know, you're a guy who moves so fast, who's doing so many things, who's, who's always running at 200 miles an hour. Did this have an effect on you? Are you changed now? I want to know how you're changed, Doshi, by the trip you made as a result of your epiphany at 3 o'clock in the morning. You know, I really appreciate that question. Uh, first of all, I think about Jerusalem every day. So that, that time at the wall and walking around and seeing all the people and experiencing something different than I expected has had a transformative change on me. There, because we probably don't have enough time to discuss some of the insights that I further had, We'll save that for another time. But how I have been changed is I decided to focus even further, that I saw the importance, the interconnectedness of all things and how critical it is not to work on so many things, but to distill down a couple of things and make a much deeper impact in them. So that trip to Jerusalem not only is something spiritually that's in my heart, but is, is changing the way, uh, is affecting the way that I approach the context of my entire life and what are some of the major topics or things, issues that I'm going to work on to try to make a difference in and to inspire other people to do, do so. And I, I will leave with this. Behavioral and mental health is absolutely one of them uh, because I see it. You know, I, I was back at you. I, I was in uh, Amherst uh, uh, this past weekend and was watching Anthony Bourdain. And uh, it, it brought tears to my eyes because he was one of the most uh, intelligent kind of wonderful shows that I, I loved watching his, his take on the world. And of course, you know, he committed suicide. Yes. And so I think uh, behavioral health uh, is becoming an uh, increasing problem in Hawaii uh, with the native Hawaiian population, particularly the males, uh, with lack of hope and uh, economic opportunity. So I think it's, uh, that's one of the de definitive areas where we're going to bring uh, high levels of technologies, everything from AI, AR, uh, and, and other technologies to bear, and how can we use them uh, to positively impact the area of behavioral and mental health? I'll leave you with that. Well, I'll leave you with the notion that we have had a number of mental health shows here on Think Tech. Hope you get a chance to listen to them. Uh, also, I want to say it's so nice to know you, Doshi. It's really wonderful, and I hope we get to talk like this before you actually physically return to Hawaii uh, so we can explore more of these issues. That's Prashant Doshi. He's the chief evangelist of Shreem LLC, and we are happy to know him. Thank you, Doshi. Mahalo. Ahuhio. <laughs>